Hi right, everyone, welcome back to Cody's Lab. So I thought I'd take a break from another project that I've been beating my head against for the past three years and show you a little something that I learned in sophomore year of high school chemistry. So I'm gonna add some pure water to this pot and I'm gonna turn on this induction cooktop and boil. <laughs> so right now the water's vapor pressure is fairly low and it's just slowly evaporating and as I raise the temperature the vapor pressure will increase and the evaporation rate will also increase. Now if we skip forward a little bit eventually we reach a point where the vapor pressure of the water is equal to its confining pressure the force that the atmosphere is putting onto the liquid. Once it's able to do that it's able to evaporate from the entire volume instead of just the surface. So it's expanding and bubbling, boiling. That's what boiling is. And that's occurring at about 207 degrees Fahrenheit. Now at sea level that'd be about 212. I'm at a fairly high altitude right now. Now something about boiling is the water's pulling away energy. So even if I were to increase the rate that I'm adding energy to the pot, increasing the rate of heating, the temperature really won't change because the water will just boil faster. I'm not going to see that here. It might fluctuate a little bit. You know, we don't live in a perfect world, but it should stay right about there, even though I've added another 400 watts of power. Yeah, see, it's not changed much at all. Now, watch what happens when I add some salt. So this is a non-volatile solute. Now initially, because the salt's cold, the temperature is of course gonna go down. So let's uh, let it warm back up. Here we are a couple of minutes later. It's come to equilibrium again. And the temperature has increased by a couple of degrees. We're up around uh, 2, 211, approximately. To show what's happening at a microscopic scale, let's make a little model here. So this is my container. And these marbles are the water molecules. Now, when they have thermal energy, water molecules are just moving around, colliding with each other, the walls of the container, etc. If we add energy from the bottom, you know, from the bottom of the pan, molecules gain a little bit of speed, they fly up, hit another water molecule, and that water molecule we hit another water molecule, transferring it up to the top of the liquid. Now, if it gets enough energy, the water molecule will leave the liquid entirely. It will go into the gas phase. It will enter the atmosphere. So this is evaporation. Now, if this is sealed, so these are trapped, they have to stick around, then they'll, they'll come back sometimes. They'll hit the liquid, they'll dissipate their energy, and then get stuck. And when the water molecules are leaving the liquid at the same rate that they're coming in, we're at equilibrium. And whatever this equilibrium pressure is, that's the vapor pressure. Now let's add some salt particles. Now salt particles, they're not very volatile. The energy that it takes to get a salt molecule to enter the gas phase is very high, at least 10 times that of what it was for a water molecule. So when the water molecule hits the salt, it just the salt might jiggle around a little bit, absorb the energy, and then slowly dissipate it. It's not really going to go anywhere. It's definitely not going to leave the liquid. So if you have some salt molecules or particles out here near the surface of the liquid, then it stops the water molecules from being able to leave. It decreases the area that the water molecules have to escape the liquid. See, they can still leave, but if they heat a salt molecule, then they don't. But here's what's really interesting. These molecules that are out here floating around, if they come back, see normally if they hit the liquid, they can dissipate the energy, be absorbed, and be reunited with the liquid. But if they hit the salt, well, the same thing happens. The salt absorbs the energy and jigs around, you know. But now the water molecules sitting here and it can just go on in. 
So effectively, this acts like a one-way valve, keeping the water molecules in the liquid phase. It lowers the vapor pressure. It pulls the water molecules out of the gas phase into the liquid phase. So in order to have the same number of water molecules out here in the gas phase to have the same vapor pressure, the temperature has to be higher. They have to be moved around faster. They have to leave more often through the spaces that they have available. That means the boiling point increases because in order to have the vapor pressure high enough to overcome atmospheric pressure, it has to be hotter. Now because I had snow on the ground, I'll point out that right here where I spilled the salt, the snow is melting. And over here where there is no salt, the snow isn't melting. And if I gather up some of the melting snow, stick a thermometer in it, you can see the temperature is lower than the normal melting point of water. In solid water, ice, we just have the water molecules stuck together in a repeating pattern. If we have another water molecule come in, it might stick and fit into the pattern. This scenario, we have the water freezing. If it comes in with a little bit more energy, it may still stick, but then kick off one or more other water molecules from the crystal. In this case, we have the water melting. And it's, an equi and it's another equilibrium process. Water molecules go in, water molecules come off. In, off. Now what happens if we add salt? Well, the salt does a few things. First, it physically blocks the water molecules from reaching the crystal. And second, the salt particle, well, it doesn't stick to the crystal. It doesn't fit into the crystal lattice. It doesn't fit the pattern. So it'll collide and then bounce right back off. It doesn't want to stick. But it does carry energy that can cause water molecules to be broken off. And so the salt kind of wears away at the crystal. And because of this, the equilibrium is going to be that in order for the ice to be forming faster than it's coming apart, it has to be colder. The temperature has to be lower. The freezing point is lower when the salt is present. So effectively, salt increases the liquid range that water has. It increases the boiling point and decreases the melting point. Now, let's uh, turn this off for a minute and let's replace the water. Yeah. With some ethyl alcohol. Let's actually rinse the pot, get rid of the last of the salt. Just make sure it's clean. Okay. Now maybe you can tell why I'm doing this outdoors using an induction cooktop. This is exceedingly dangerous. And I don't recommend anyone replicate this at home. I'm fairly confident I can do it safely. I am prepared to run if I'm wrong though. Alright, put that back in and turn the cooktop back on. I'm definitely going to stay here and watch this. Uh, fortunately, I can cut the video and skip ahead. But the same thing should be happening vapor pressure of the alcohol will increase as the temperature increases eventually it'll reach a point where it's boiling okie dokes let me actually turn that down a few see the alcohol is boiling and the temperature it's boiling is about 150 fahrenheit much lower than the water in fact just feeling it if the, the vapor coming off of this feels cooler than the water did significantly cooler. It's kind of neat. Again, super dangerous because this is going to be extremely flammable. I don't have any ignition sources around nearby, hopefully. <laughs> okay, so now if I put salt in here, uh, assuming it was a salt that dissolves in alcohol, it would do the same thing. It would raise the boiling point. 
but let's try it with water. What do you think is going to happen? Let's just add a little bit of water and see what it does. Now, of course, it's going to cool down again. So let's let it heat back up and see where the uh, temperature reaches when it's boiling. All right, here we are. You see it is no longer 150 and it's also not 210. It's about 165. The temperature that the two solvents are boiling at is somewhere in the middle. Now if I knew the exact mole fraction, I could calculate it. I could figure out where they would have been boiling. But my point is that the mixture of the two, it doesn't boil at the temperature of the lowest boiling solvent. And you can actually see the, uh, the temperature should start increasing over time as the alcohol leaves, because the alcohol fraction is going to be more preferential to escape. And as it leaves, the mole fraction of water will increase, and so the boiling point will more reflect the water's boiling point. Eventually this will reach the boiling point of water. All right, I'm gonna turn this off before I start a huge fire. Now the case where you have two volatile substances, the water and the alcohol mixed together, a little bit more complicated than it was with the water and the salt because the alcohol, well, it is volatile. In fact, it's more volatile than the water is. And that's despite the fact that the alcohol molecules are actually heavier and physically larger than the water. This is because they don't stick together as much as the water does. Water has hydrogen bonding, which holds it together. The alcohol doesn't have as much. Anyway, if we have alcohol molecules sitting here on the surface and water comes in, let's say the water's got enough energy, it could leave the liquid. But if it collides with the alcohol, it'll transfer its energy. It'll come back, get stuck in the liquid, and the alcohol will leave into the gas phase. It'll take the place of the water. And vice versa, we the alcohol water is mixed together. The alcohol has enough energy to leave. It'll collide with the water. The water will take the energy. Alcohol will go back in. And the water could leave the liquid, or more likely, it'll just take that energy and end up back in the liquid phase. Now, coming back in from gas to liquid, it doesn't matter whether they hit alcohol or water. Same as with the water and salt either one. So what that happens is both of the vapor pressures will be decreased. Like if you had two containers, in fact I've got a video where I did this, uh, look up the Dalton's Law video. If you have two containers, one with two different liquids and they're inside of a larger container, the total pressure inside that will be higher than it would be if those liquids were mixed together. That makes sense? So anyway, this total pressure will be the sum of the partial pressures which are reduced by their mole fraction. So if you have 50% alcohol, 50% water, the vapor pressure of pure alcohol will be reduced by 50%, and the vapor pressure of pure water will be reduced for 50%. So in order to get this new mixture to boil, that new vapor pressure has to exceed the atmospheric pressure which means the temperature has to be increased to more than the boiling point of the volatile liquid. The effect I've demonstrated in this video is known as Riot's Law. And I used alcohol, water, and salt as an example, but anything that doesn't chemically react will follow this. In fact, so will metals. I saw some people on Reddit the other day arguing whether or not zinc will boil from molten brass? And the answer is no, the zinc is not boiling. It's just slowly evaporating from the surface of the melt. See, zinc's boiling point when pure is lower than the melting point of brass, but the copper, the copper atoms are stopping the zinc from leaving the melt and it's reducing the vapor pressure. The only way you would get zinc boiling out of the copper is if you were on the top of a very tall mountain, you had a low atmospheric pressure, or it was way too hot. In fact, I've seen zinc boiling out of a molten mixture of metals, and it is very violent. It's like opening a shaken soda, and instead of erupting a sticky liquid, it's uh, you know, flaming metal. Very much don't recommend. 
<laughs> but anyway, I've used a flux, you know, a thin molten mixture on top of the metal to keep the zinc from evaporating out of the brass. It's kind of like putting a sandwich in a plastic bag to keep it from drying out. The atmospheric pressure is pushing on the bag, and that's holding pressure, keeping the water from evaporating. In the case of zinc, it's a layer of flux. If we were in a vacuum, then the vapor pressure would cause the bag to inflate. If the water inside the sandwich was boiling, then it would also cause the bag to inflate. It would overcome the pressure surrounding it. It could cause the bag to burst. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this little refresher. I'm going to get back to work. I'll see you next time.